Let's all be seated. Thank you for singing those encouraging words with heart and soul so that we might call on the God of Jacob in our lives together in God's church. Well, if nothing else, Stephen is fluent in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. In verses 17 through 43 of chapter 7, he is going to continue his rehearsal of Israel's history. This has a history of its own. Oftentimes, Old Testament prophets and narrative writers and psalmists would recite Israel's history, asking those who heard the recital to draw certain conclusions from the history that was rehearsed. And so this morning, Stephen is going to rehearse the three stages of Moses' life, each approximately 40 years in length, from 0 to 40, from 40 to 80, from 80 to 120. He is going to rehearse that life, giving its details fluently. And then he is going to ask his hearers to draw certain conclusions mainly by way of implication. So together, let's read verses 17 through 43, certainly the longest part of the longest speech in the book of Acts. Interesting, compelling, important. The word of the Lord. But at the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham... The people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born and he was lovely in the sight of God And he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brothers understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, He appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? 
is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness, together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai, and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices, Forty years in the wilderness was it, O house of Israel. You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. This ends the reading of the word of the Lord. For the earliest church and the origins of earliest Christianity, Stephen is a pivotal figure. From his speech, he becomes the first Christian martyr. From his teaching, the church receives its first general persecution. They are scattered and harried out of the land. All this because of Stephen's unique teaching. Let's review his life just for a moment and understand what ignited this persecution and caused his death. Stephen, we know, was a Hellenist. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews who had lived in the wide dispersion of the ancient world. They had lived there in many instances for generations. But because of a love for their homeland and an attachment to the temple liturgy, they relocated, they resettled in Jerusalem and became devotees of the temple and its sacrifices offered there on the temple mount. These Hellenists, many of whom were rigid in their devotion to the temple, many of them also were converted by the Aramaic-speaking Jews who followed the apostles. We read in Acts chapter 6 that so many Hellenists were converted that their widows grew in number to the point that the early church could not feed them from the common fund donated by the earliest Christians. Therefore, the apostles laid their hands on seven Hellenists, one of whom was Stephen. We are told that he was wise and that he was full of the Holy Spirit. Well, He also was inspired by the Holy Spirit. His speech, recorded by Luke, is an example of that inspiration. But Luke has depicted Stephen as entering the Hellenist synagogues and teaching that Jesus was the Messiah. This teaching that Jesus was the Messiah went along with Stephen's unique conviction that in the coming of Jesus Christ, 
the formerly valid temple and all that pertained to it, the daily canon of its offices, the sacrifices, and the appearance of God there. All these things now had passed away because the new order had come in Jesus Christ and God uniquely revealed himself in the person of Christ. This teaching excited great hostility from the Hellenists in the synagogue of the freedmen. freedmen. This we read in Acts chapter 6 and verse 9. It reminds us that though Hellenists had been dispersed throughout the empire, when they did return and repatriate Jerusalem, they were loyal to the temple. They took offense at what Stephen indicated had taken place in the coming of Jesus Christ. Just for a moment, let's consider several teachings in the later books of the New Testament that may suggest what Stephen said in his speech and in his teaching in the synagogue of the freedman, a Hellenist synagogue within the precincts of Jerusalem. Well, we read, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew that the temple veil was rent in two, indicating clearly to Matthew and his readers that the temple was now obsolete and that God gained, that individuals gained access to God through Jesus Christ. They could now enter directly into God's presence through Jesus. In the book of John, we have several indications of John's teaching on this subject. For example, it says that the Word of God tabernacled among us, and the word tabernacle suggests that now in the coming of Christ, he is the one who reveals God to us. He is God manifested among us. Later in verse 18 of chapter 1, we read in John's gospel that the one and only God who is at the Father's side, he has explained him. Once again, it is through Jesus Christ that we now have access to God and that God does manifest His presence uniquely through Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews, we read that God has indicated there through the author that the law was a shadow of good things to come. And now that the shadow, now that the good things have come, the things of the new covenant fulfilled in Jesus Christ, now that the good things have come, the shadows have passed away, indicating once again that the institutions such as the temple of the Mosaic covenant have passed away in their immediate significance and God uniquely reveals himself now through Jesus Christ. Now these letters and gospels, Matthew, John, 1 Peter, and the book of Hebrews, these are examples from later New Testament writings that the temple indeed would become obsolete after the coming of Jesus the Messiah. But that was not altogether clear in the early church, and it was Stephen alone who seems to have had the insight that indeed the temple was passing away. And as he articulated teaching along these lines, he was resisted by fierce hostility and the Hellenists, ironically, drag him before the Sanhedrin. And they drag him before the Sanhedrin, chapter 6 told us, because he had given offense and spoken against the holy place, the iconic temple. And he had spoken against Moses, whose writings in the Torah had authorized the temple. It is the first theological division in the book of Acts. Formally, although the apostles taught the resurrection, there had not been a cleavage with the Sanhedrin, other than the Sanhedrin warning them to no longer teach in the name of Jesus. But the temple had not been an issue. The apostles, like Jesus, had taught in the temple. In fact, 
they had co-opted the temple, causing jealousy among the Sanhedrin and causing them to beat the apostles, which we read in Acts chapter 5. That, however, was an attack upon the apostles. It was not the persecution that we'll see next week spread across all of the Jewish believers in Jesus following the death of Stephen. Well, last week, we saw one of the two themes of Stephen's speech. That is, that God has appeared to his people in the age of the patriarchs, singularly and most importantly, Abraham, that God had appeared to them not only outside of the land of Israel, but also through the medium that God's presence was mediated not through the temple, but God spoke directly to Abraham, not mediating his presence through the temple. So Stephen is contending in that first 16 verses of Acts chapter 7, Stephen is contending that the temple was superfluous to life in the age of the patriarchs. It was unnecessary. God revealed himself directly to them without the medium of the temple. Now he is going to add a second theme in verses 17 through 43. And that theme is that although he has been accused of offending against Moses and the temple, it is in fact consistent with the Old Testament record that the Sanhedrin's forebears, the Jews of Moses' day, rejected the leadership of Moses. And just as they had rejected the leaders of Moses in the days of the Torah, now in the day that Jesus had come, they have rejected the one that God had sent as, a, as Moses had prefigured him. They had rejected the prophet like unto Moses, Jesus. In other words, just as the, the, the children of Israel rejected Moses, so they would also reject Jesus. And in rejecting him, fall into idolatry and judgment. Now, the recounting in brief of Stephen's recital of Moses' life. Two circumstances conspire together in verses 17 and 18. It is hard times for Jewish parents. Two things have happened. First, God in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant is multiplying greatly the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The children of Israel, Jacob renamed Israel, the children of Israel are multiplying in the land and simultaneously the second matter is that a Pharaoh has arisen. We have some speculation about who that Pharaoh may have been. But that is not particularly important to us this morning. It is his attitude to the children of Israel that is significant. He fears that they have become so numerous that they will revolt and that they will overthrow the leadership of the Pharaonic uh, hierarchy and that the children of Israel will prove to be enemies of Egypt. And for this reason, he prescribes infanticide. All the t male children of Israel are to be exposed. The exposure of children is common in pagan cultures. It took place in Greece, it took place in Rome, and we have here an indication that it took place also in Egypt. Male children were put out and exposed to the elements and with the anticipation that they would die. This is the dictum of the Pharaoh about whom we have spoken. Children of Israel are to be exposed, the male children are to die, and this is to lessen the threat and the possibility of revolt 
by the children of Israel. He does not know Mo, he does not know Joseph. Joseph had been a leading figure in Pharaoh's cabinet, and not only so, but Pharaoh had invited his descendants into the land during a time of famine. This Pharaoh does not know Joseph, does not know the children of Israel's history, and exposes their infants to eliminate their threat from the land of Egypt. And Stephen says dramatically in verse 20, it was at this time that Moses was born. In other words, he was born into a time of great risk for infant sons. And yet, in Stephen saying that, he is preparing us to understand that God providentially spares Moses. Moses was born at this time, and continuing in verse 20, it says he was lovely in the sight of God. This indicates God's favor to Moses. And God providentially spares Moses. The two words nurtured help us. He was nurtured three months in his father's home. There, his parents, apparently from Exodus chapter 6, his parents are Amram and Jochebed. They resist the king's edict by faith, the book of Hebrews tells us, and they keep Moses in their home and nurture him for three months. They do not expose him. But at the end of three months, they are forced to put him out. You're aware of the story in Exodus chapter 2 where Moses is put in a pitched basket and set along the banks of the Nile. There he is recovered by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses' sister calls Moses' mother, and she becomes the nurse for her own son Moses. And Stephen is telling us in this narrative and telling the Sanhedrin that God had especially protected Moses. He was favored by God. He was providentially protected by God. And although his parents' efforts were only partially successful, God so worked in the life and the events of Egypt's history that Moses not only was protected providentially from destruction, but also he was set, he became the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter and was educated, verse 22, in all the learning of the Egyptians. So hearers of, of this first 40 years of Moses' life understand that God has uniquely protected Moses. He has a specific destiny in the economy of God. He is going to be a deliverer, a redeemer, and a judge of the people, as well as a unique prophet who will give them living oracles that we call the Torah. So this is the first short section in which we are to understand again that God has his hand on Moses and that Moses is being providentially prepared to lead the people of Israel. The second section, forthcoming, verses 23 through 29, have similar incidents on successive days. It tells us that about the age of 40, Moses has an intuition and that intuition is, as mentioned in the book of Hebrews, a matter of faith. He has an intuition that his destiny is tied to the people of the sons of the patriarchs, that the sons of Israel are his kinsmen, and that he has a destiny that is tied to them. And so, on a particular happenstance, that is recorded in Exodus and again given here by Stephen. On a particular day, Moses observes an Egyptian oppressing and afflicting one of his Israelite brothers. And it is true a homicide occurs. The Bible doesn't tell us what moral judgment we are to render. Neither Exodus nor Acts renders a moral judgment on this. Perhaps the killing of the Egyptian was justified. Neither Exodus nor Acts tells us about it. But what it does tell us 
is that this intuition that Moses has that he is to be a deliverer, that he is to be one whose destiny is wrapped up with the children of Israel, that he does deliver the Israelite by taking the life of the Egyptian. And as I've said, there are similar events on successive days because the next day he is out and he sees two Israelites fighting. One is oppressing the other and he inquires of them, why are you fighting against one another? You are brothers. And intentionally, Stephen quotes from the book of Exodus in verse 27 as Moses intervenes between the two Israelites who are feuding and fighting. The individual says, the individual who is aggressive and injuring his neighbor says, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Stephen's indication that even at the beginning when Moses is now associating himself with the children of Israel, that the Israelite himself resists Moses and resists Moses' leadership and does not recognize that Moses is a friend and an ally to them and they are to look to him for deliverance. On the other hand, he tells Moses that who made you a ruler and a deliverer to us? Moses recognizes in his words that it is now common knowledge apparently that he has taken the life of an Egyptian. Stephen has Moses flee to Midian, once again outside the boundaries of the Holy Land. So this next 40 years is given in summary beginning in verse 30. And the particular intent of this again is to sequentially present Moses' life in a way that the hearers and the readers understand that as Moses becomes notionally aware that he is going to be the deliverer and the judge of Israel, the children of Israel from the very beginning are resistant to him. In verse 30, Stephen iterates the theme that he that he spoke of in the first 16 verses of chapter, chapter 7. And that theme being that God appeared directly to Abraham in Mesopotamia and Haran. Now verse 30 says this, An angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. God again is appearing directly to a prophet, without the medium of a temple, and outside the boundaries of Jewish soil. So, this is exhibit C. God appeared to Abraham, unmediated by a temple. God rescued the patriarchs in Egypt, outside of the grounds of the Holy Land, unmediated by a temple. Now also, the prophet par excellence Moses God communicates directly with him without the medium of the temple and outside the boundaries of Jewish soil. And this theme now, Stephen is building, that just as God appeared in those ages without, without the temple, so when Jesus has come, God is also going to make himself known in the person of Jesus rather than through the temple. The temple was not necessary in the age of the patriarchs. The temple was not necessary in the age of Moses and the Torah. And now that Messiah has come, the temple is no longer necessary. God reveals himself in the person of Jesus. This is one of the great events in the Old Testament. And it would help us to consider something personally in this section. The account is simply a rehearsal, a recital, if you will, of what the book of Exodus tells us. God reveals himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in verse 32, but it is verse 33 that reminds us of something important in the text that 
I think should be a perennial concern to us at all times. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Before God gives his revelation to Moses, he asks Moses to recognize that standing before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is standing before the true and living God, and because he is, he is to take off his sandals, he is living and standing on holy ground. And throughout our lives as Christians, though this is slightly a sideline from what Stephen is developing concerning Moses and the Israelites' rejection of his leadership, nevertheless it is important for us to always recognize that God expects us to nurture this concept of his holiness and to make certain that we do not come before him flippantly or carelessly. Indeed, when God speaks, he asks us to take off our sandals, for we are standing on holy ground. You may remember that in Joshua chapter 5, God says the same thing to Joshua. So we as Christians who have had a direct revelation from God in the person of Jesus Christ should be careful to recognize that as Christians we are living and standing on holy ground. But the point here is, God goes on to say in verse 34 that indeed he has seen the affliction of his people and the words are direct to Moses. I will send you to Egypt. So again, listeners understand that not only has God favored Moses from birth, not only has God appeared to Moses outside the land without the medium of a temple, but God is now directly sending and commi commissioning and sending Moses to deliver the children of Israel. And in verse 36, Stephen makes this pronouncement. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent, to be both a ruler and a deliverer. Again, that is that even though God had sent him, providentially protecting him, commissioning him, sending him, appearing to him, that these individuals in the word of the New American Standard Version disowned Moses. They did not receive his claim to be deliverer and judge. They did not respond to his leadership that God had conferred upon him in the wilderness of Sinai. They resist the prophet whom God had sent to be their deliverer and their redeemer. It's interesting, the word deliverer is the word redeemer, and it's the only noun form of this word in the whole New Testament. God is sending a redeemer and a deliverer, and the children of Israel are rejecting him. There are five uses of the word this, We'll rehearse them. The demonstrative pronoun this. This Moses was disowned, verse 35. This man, in verse 36, performed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. The words wonders and signs are taken from earlier in the book of Acts where Jesus is said to perform wonders and signs. This is a prophet that has signs given to him by God, nevertheless he is rejected. Third use of this, verse 37, this is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. In other words, Moses is not the end of the prophets. God is going to raise up another prophet like him to whom they are to listen. This is re rehearsed in Peter's speech in Acts chapter 3 and verse 22, this is Deuteronomy 18, 15, and it applies directly to Jesus. Stephen is saying Moses recognized that he was not the final and ultimate prophet, that God was going to raise up a prophet like him, and that prophet like him in Acts 3, 22 has already been identified as Jesus. That is the fourth this. The fifth this is in verse 39 when 
he says that when Moses went up to get the tablets the, called the living oracles and went up on the mountain, the children of Israel, quoting from the book of Exodus in verse 30, in verse 40 says, For this Moses who led us up out of the Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. They dismiss Moses in his absence as he is on Mount Sinai. This is the fourth indication of Stephen that the Israelite fathers, the fathers of the Sanhedrin to whom he is speaking, had rejected Moses out of hand. And just as they had rejected Moses, so also they were rejecting Jesus. In verse 41, as we move toward the conclusion of Stephen's speech, he says that the rejection of the prophet leads them into a descent into idolatry. Verse 41, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol. That this rejection of God's appointed leader eventually led them into a heinous act of idolatrous worship. The casting of the golden calf under the willing leadership, under the begrudging leadership of Aaron, they cast out a calf. And the Bible says here that God, in verse 42, turned away. And the words imply that if you turn away from the prophet that God has sent, of whom Moses spoke, if you turn away from him, you have not only turned the temple into an idol, but you have rejected God, and God will turn away and judge you. And these are the implications of Stephen's speech to them. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. Now, if you are a, an attentive listener to this speech, as the Sanhedrin undoubtedly were, they sense the drift and the direction of what Stephen is saying. They respond, as we'll see next week, by stoning him to death. Why so? Because he is saying again that God now manifests his unique presence to his people through the person of Jesus the Christ. And whether it be that the temple is rent or Jesus is the Logos tabernacling among us or whether it is the very God, the only begotten God, Jesus, who has explained God or whether it is the book of Hebrews where the shadows pass away and the reality of the true comes... However Stephen makes his contention and his argument, it is plain to them that he is implying that now the temple is passe and that God is revealing himself through Jesus and through Jesus alone. This kind of teaching was what made the Hellenists in the Hellenist synagogue reject Stephen and it is this teaching that is going to cause the Sanhedrin to view him as guilty of blasphemy and to take his life by stoning. Not only will that happen, but now that there is an apparent in the minds of the Sanhedrin and many of the Jews, there, now that there is an attack upon the temple, there is a specific doctrinal divide. There is a specific theological difference between the followers of Jesus who find God manifested uniquely in him and those who are continued devotees of the temple and who will reject Jesus out of hand because he appears to change the customs delivered to them by Moses. It is the first break in the Christian church with the specific break theologically in the early and earliest origins of Christianity that we have, and it is the result of Stephen's speech. He concludes it by a quote from Amos chapter 5, verse 25, and that is written in large print, probably in your Bibles, indicating that it is a quote from the Old Testament. He quotes 
in verse 43, end of verse 42 and verse 43. This is Amos 5.25. It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? A rhetorical question indicating that really in the wilderness wanderings, the fathers of the Sanhedrin had not really offered sacrifices to the true and living God. They had offered them to idols that they had worshipped and that they were worshipping. He goes on to quote the rest of Amos by saying, You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampa, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. And this is a fulfillment of what the prophet Amos had said, that the people of Israel, having rejected the, their prophet Moses, descended into idolatry, and as a result, God turned away, God judged them, and God sent them into captivity, Amos giving the destination beyond Israel into Babylon as the place of their dispersion and judgment. So the scene is now set for Stephen's conclusion next week and their martyrdom of Stephen. It has its beginnings in a Hellenist synagogue where the implication is that Jesus is the unique manifestation of God. The mosaic economy is now passe and unnecessary. And that implication leads to his arrest, to his trial before the Sanhedrin, and to his martyrdom. And from that martyrdom, there is a cleavage between the Sanhedrin and unbelieving Jewry and the Church of the Apostles, which is scattered throughout Judea, and the word of God is taken to others who will believe the message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fluent and complete grasp that Stephen has of his sources. He is able to marshal a telling argument from a recital of Old Testament history, indicting his accusers with rejection of your prophet Moses and idolatry as a result in the judgment of God. We thank you that you spoke to Moses and used him and sent him with the message that a prophet would arise like him and that your people should listen to that prophet. We know that that prophet is Jesus Christ. And we know that we no longer have to use a temple to find access to God. But the temple veil has been rent, and we are able to come in direct access to you through Jesus Christ, the prophet like unto Moses. We give you great thanks for the courage of the early church and the courage of evangelists like Stephen. And we pray, Lord, that as you speak to us through Jesus Christ, and as you have made yourself known to us through him, that we might take off our sandals recognizing that when you speak, we are on holy ground. Bless us as your people. Keep us as your chosen ones. Prevent us from turning away from the word that has been delivered. And as we take off our sandals and listen to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Reveal himself to us in Jesus Christ. We pray that we may be your children now and forevermore until the day of everlasting things. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.